You know, this is just the start of our talk tonight. We plan to continue the conversation during a town hall on Facebook and streaming at 8 o'clock. Joining us for our discussion tonight, Channel 7 Editorial Director Chuck Stokes, Jalila Ahmed, the superintendent of Hamtramck Public Schools, the owner of Avis Ford, Mark Douglas, and Steve Spitzer, president and CEO of the Michigan Roundtable for Diversity and Inclusion. Now, we have time for just one quick question in the few seconds we have left. Steve, what is one key point you think is important to talk about in our next hour, giving maybe 20 seconds? Well, look, this stuff uh, is deep in us. It's not going to change without a developmental approach. I'm accountable to those that are harmed and to uh, the organizations and neighborhoods we live. Um, we need to be strong, not take it personally, and stay in it for the long haul. You're right about that. Our town hall conversation is about to get started. Thank you for joining us tonight for this special presentation of Hidden Bias of Good People. Join us for the town hall on our Facebook page. Ask your own questions in the comments, WXYZ.com, Roku, and all your favorite streaming devices. Dr. Marks really laid out the groundwork for all of us, and now we want to continue the conversation. Thank you for staying with us tonight. I'm Carolyn Clifford. And good evening to you. I'm Dave Llewellyn. And I'm Glenda Lewis, and for the next hour, we are going to go in-depth into hidden bias, laying it out all on the table, working together to find a way forward. Tonight, we're joined by a panel of community stakeholders. We have Jalila Ahmed, the superintendent of Hamtramck Public Schools, Mark Douglas, president and owner of Avis Ford in Southfield, Steve Spritzer, president and CEO of Michigan Roundtable for Diversity and Inclusion, and of course our own Channel 7 Community Affairs Director, Chuck Stokes. Thank you all for joining us this evening. You know, I'm going to start mm -hmm. our discussion off tonight. I just want to know, what was your reaction to what we just saw with Dr. Bryant Marks? Chuck, let's start with you. My reaction was, uh, I liked the way he presented the case that he had to make. He started rather slow uh, in a non-confrontational way. And then he sort of drew everyone in. And then he took on the tougher, more difficult topics, more sensitive topics. But he did it in a very civil way. Uh, and he kept emphasizing the fact that, uh, that we can have these implicit biases even though we're good people and it's not a representation of our character. And he made, I think, the case for this is a, becoming an increasingly diverse country, state, city. Uh, we have to learn to live with each other and we have to learn how to appreciate each other's differences and respect each other's differences. Anyone else want to weigh in? Uh, Steve, you want to go next? Just a reaction to yeah, I'm really glad that uh, Dr. Marx uh, made reference to the systems within which we live. So we can come with these biases, which we all do, but they can be reinforced and supported by the systems we live in. And I think just looking at the officer who killed George Floyd, um, you have to look at that police department. You have to look at the ecosystem. Folks knew that things weren't right at that police department, but they all worked together to allow it to happen. And in this case, it led to death. And Jalila, why don't you weigh in next? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I appreciated his sense of understanding on, you know, things that we do not know. Um, how do we approach that with our students with uh, and, and not erase their understanding and their history? I appreciate the fact that we need to be more of an asset based um, a community in how we communicate and how we share uh, information with our students, you know, considering Black History Month has just passed, uh, honoring the uh, the uh, contributions uh, of Black Black Americans, uh, African Americans is the way to go. Versus uh, discussing uh, and the the deficits uh, of the history. So I definitely appreciate that uh, approach. Wonderful. And finally, Mark, just give us your reaction, and then I'm going to turn it to Dave. Well, um, you know, the number one thing, and it's interesting, I make this exact point to my children all the time, that they need to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Because there's often times, and, and to Dr. Marx's point, um, there's often times where, um, you know, you have to sort of step out there and, 
and, and be comfortable with not only who you are, but who you're interfacing with and, and recognizing that, you know, there's, there's differences among us all and, and we have to be able to discuss them and ultimately uh, that, that's the direction that we have to take to move forward. Wonderful, thank you all. Dave? And Mark, let me, uh, let me start with you on this. Uh, experiences of implicit bias in our community. Uh, your father, Walter, started uh, Avis Ford. Uh, you're mm -hmm. now running Avis Ford. You're dealing with the public, all, uh, all types of individuals in our community, selling cars. How about your particular, maybe from a, from a professional level, uh, implicit bias in our community. Do you see it? Do you experience it? Do you feel it? Well, I mean, absolutely. It's interesting. One of the things I always try to say or, or, or do and, and live by is that I'm not just an African-American dealer. I'm a dealer that just happens to be African-American. So uh, I don't know if you remember back in the day we had Mel Farr. He, he kind of took that mantle as the black dealer in the metro Detroit community. Well, I don't necessarily want to be that. I just want to be a dealer that happens to be African American. Um, and uh, and but but you know, there's there's times where, and actually, to be honest, that that was one of the reasons why uh, we kept the name Avis Ford because it had sort of not only did it have goodwill attached with it for you know the many years that it had been in business prior to my father purchasing it, but the main thing was that uh, it kind of gave us a. a uh, an anonymous state, so to speak, because Avis is very recognized as the rental car company. And, um, you know, we didn't need, feel the need to put our name on the mantle to say, hey, look, this is us. It was another way of integrating the system because in, in, in our business, there's often times where you can be discriminated against simply based on, especially, mind you, this was 1986, in that era where, you know, people may not come to you because you're a black dealer in a, in a community that wasn't necessarily, you know, all black or African-American. So, uh, so yeah, so we experience it, but at the same time, you know, we, we try to make our sales staff and our, uh, and our overall dealership image reflect that of the community. So we've got all types of people that work here. It's not just because I'm a black owner doesn't mean that, you know, everyone that works here is black. So, uh, so we, we, we do our best to make sure that we are a reflection of the community that we serve. Well, we certainly appreciate that. Glenda, why don't you take the next question? All right, Carolyn, you know, we did hear Dr. Marks talk about implicit bias being a part of humanity. Um, you know, things that are repeated behaviors that we see and just have impressions of. And it won't go away until we work on it. Let's take a look at his clip there and then we'll get back with a question. Dr. Marks, in light of what's been going on in America right now with such a divide, do you believe your talks about bias and implicit bias are more important now than ever before? Yes, absolutely. Lots going on in our country. We had a pretty divisive uh, political season uh, this past fall into January. Uh, lots going on, civil unrest, the virus disproportionately hitting different groups. So lots going on in our country around race, ethnicity, and, and so forth. These discussions around race and gender and politics and disability and, and so forth, I think are very much needed in order for us to heal our nation uh, following the last, not only a few months, but probably the last year. You know, we had the great opportunity, uh, Carolyn and I, to sit down with Dr. Marks prior to the show this evening. And Steve, you know, I can't take my eye off what appears to be Nelson Mandela over your shoulder um, <laughs> in your home there. And we know diversity inclusion is what you do. Um, so can you talk about um, how you erase and, and attempt to erase, you know, who people are on the outside and tap into who they are on the inside? Well, it can't be done in a vacuum, right? I think it has to be done in relationship to the other. A consequence of our hypersegregation is that there are so many others. And, um, you know, the good thing is that we're in systems, right? The, the good thing is that when a culture is, exists where it is expected of you to, um, to get to know your colleagues, to learn, and to get feedback. I mean, it takes some ego strength when I'm told I perpetrated a microaggression, right? We have to create systems that encourage and reward the right behavior. Otherwise, uh, a, a two-hour session on implicit bias isn't going to help a lot of people. In fact, it could harm people with the expectation that maybe someone's going to change. Um, yeah, hard work, though. It takes a lot of people. 
Chuck, I want to ask you a question right now because I know we have gone through diversity training here at Channel 7. You're a graduate of Morehouse College, and I heard Dr. Marks talking about seeing that whole picture of all of those African-American males, educated, graduates, doing wonderful things. Do you think training is enough? Dr. Marks talked about teaching people about implicit bias. I mean, do you think that will make the difference, teaching people, showing people? Um, I think so. I, I, I won't say that it's enough, but it is a wonderful start, and it's something that I think we have to do. Uh, we have to try to get people to open their minds uh, however we go about that process. Sometimes you have to sort of drag people into it. It may not be something they want to do or may not be something they want to volunteer to do. And we see it happening in the workplace a lot of time. Corporations are making decisions at the very highest level um, with their executives saying, we want our employees to be more sensitive because it's one, good for our society, but it's also good for business. And I think many businesses have figured out it's good for the bottom line. Uh, we live in a very diverse country and it's about supporting each other and making our communities as strong as we can. Um, so certainly if you have it in an education setting, such as Morehouse College, uh, as we often as we say, pride of the South, uh, very proud alumni, uh, you see you have it in an academic setting and they're learning and they may come in one way and then they go out four or five years later uh, with their minds much more open. But we have to also take that into other venues because not everybody is going to be fortunate enough to go to Morehouse or any other historically black college or university or uh, you know, Michigan State or University of Michigan or so many other places. But that's important. Um, you know, and, and it's about relationships when you really get right down to it. You know, I, when, when I heard Mark talk, uh, I couldn't help but smile because uh, I'm a proud owner of, of a car from, uh, from Avis Ford. Well, why is that important? Not because it's commercial for Mark, but I'm proud of the fact that that's the second generation of an African-American yes. owned dealership. And it's about supporting now. That may have been my original attraction to seek out Avis Ford when I decided I wanted to get a car. But what keeps me there? What keeps me there are good salesmen, good service, good, good client relationship, and the fact that they do good business. If Avis Ford does good business and is successful, then that's good for our city and our region as a whole. And people interact with their own kind. They also try to seek out people who are not you know, look like them, talk like them, because that's important as well. Got it. Dave? Uh, let's turn to uh, Jalila Ahmed, uh, Hamtramck Schools. Chuck talked about the education at Morehouse College. You're involved in the education of the next generation right now, certainly at, at the high school level in a diverse community. Um, is, is this important uh, with kids of high school age and can they benefit over a lifetime by this exposure to, uh, to other people from various countries, if you will, from different ethnic backgrounds. Is that going to help us with this whole question of implicit bias? Yes, absolutely. Um, you, you know, Hamtramck is known for being, you know, the world in 2.2 square miles. Uh, we, we have a lot of individuals coming to uh, Hamtramck from various countries and diversity is something what, that we strive to obtain. Um, it's important, you know, and I've shared this with uh, the staff that, you know, we never want to be comfortable because when we are comfortable, change does not happen. We, the discomforts that we have are going to push us to make the necessary improvements. And absolutely, we want our students to be aware. We want our students to be, uh, their voices to be lifted and, and for them to be a part of this important conversation. We have uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity uh, committees uh, uh, specifically for our youth voice. And just seeing that level of engagement, seeing their awareness, seeing their, their interest uh, to uncover uh, the day-to-day, -day, what they see, what they witness, and, and want change. 
uh, this is what we are all about. This is learning um, and most definitely in addition to our teachers being cognizant of the implicit bias and not only about their uh, the unconscious learned behavior, but also how are they going to combat that with combat that with uh, improvements in these areas of when they are working with our students. Wonderful. Thank you, Jalila. Uh, now, I want to go to another clip from our interview with Dr. Marks, and it's, it's about this. Our nation has been through so much in the last year, a contentious election, the pandemic, you name it. We spoke with Dr. Marks about the importance of having these discussions right now. Take a listen. Dr. Marks, in light of what's been going on in America right now with such a divide, do you believe your talks about bias and implicit bias are more important now than ever before? Yes, absolutely. Lots going on in our country. We had a pretty divisive uh, political season uh, this past fall into January. Uh, lots going on, civil unrest, the virus disproportionately hitting different groups. So lots going on in our country around race, ethnicity, and, and so forth. These discussions around race and gender and politics and disability and so forth, I think are very much needed in order for us to heal our nation uh, following the last, not only a few months, but probably the last year. So, so Mark, I want to head back to you. I mean, right now, so many things are going on. In the news today, uh, Chief Craig, the Detroit police chief, he was talking about how his police officers are being attacked right now because of what happened to George Floyd. The whole nation watched George Floyd basically die on television. I, I mean, how do we start those conversations in our community and sort of cut through the mustard with so many bad things that have happened and our nation is, has experienced really within this last year? Well, I think you have to really begin the whole process by realizing that, number one, all police officers aren't bad. You know, let, let, let's, let's break down that bias first. In fact, um, my, my father-in-law was a retired uh, police officer from uh, St. Paul. So um, he was very in tune with the, the environment, the community, things that were actually happening at the time. So all that said, um, you have to realize first, you know, you have to look at yourself and say, number one, uh, all police officers aren't, aren't bad or aren't looking to, to necessarily cause me harm. All white police officers aren't necessarily, don't all necessarily think the same way. So, so I think first we have to sort of own, you know, our bias towards, 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 uh, towards, towards the legal, uh, towards, towards the law, uh, what am I trying to say, towards the, um, towards police officers, but at the same time making sure that, uh, that we don't judge them unfairly. And, and we have to, at the same time, own some responsibility in terms of some of the things that happen to us. For instance, when we, when we don't follow commands or we don't follow orders, you know, that's, that's the thing that I've, a conversation I've had to have with my 14-year-old son that, you know, you have to, number one, own your, your, your position in the situation and, 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 and follow responsibility, follow, follow the orders or directives that are given to you. Yeah, it may be uncomfortable. It may, it may put you in a position where, where you feel like you may be denigrated or what have you, but at the end of the day, you'll walk away if you, if you follow the rules, well, at least you hope to, at least. I mean, but, but the reality is, you, you know, we've got to sort of take our position or own our, our stake in the, in, the, in the position, but at the same time, not judge them unfairly. Thank you so much, Mark. Dave? Um, I want to turn to Steve because of the work that uh, you've done for years. You've had meetings uh, regularly here at, uh, at Channel 7 uh, at the old farmhouse with the uh, community stakeholders as well, talking about uh, equity and inclusion and diversity. Um, how, how typically uh, are those conversations received when you're when you're meeting with groups with individuals with stakeholders in the community thanks dave fire up chips yeah uh, look the um conversations are hard and uh for folks that haven't developed that muscle of uh, empathy of curiosity of seeing the other to their own wholeness um there is a fragility there is a, a lack of the ability to grow and so then feedback, right? If you're, if you're harming a person who's other than you by the way you're acting, and you may not even know that, but if you're not seen as someone who can receive the feedback, that person will just shake the dust and not give it to you. So uh, conversations are hard. It's harder when you go deeper, right? Mm -hmm. If we're just talking about diversity issues, eh, 
But when we move over to racial justice and equity, boy, that's that's a big jump. That's a lot harder for people to manage. But I, I think that you, you stay at it. You get feedback. The soul is a muscle. The mind is a muscle. You, you rebuild it with the new information. But I think short of being accountable to the people that are at risk of harm because of their identity, if you are accountable to them, who are you accountable to? And that just kind of shifts us from treating it like a charitable issue to the issue of racial justice is a justice issue. And it really calls for us to center the voices of the people most at harm and then be accountable to those voices. So the conversations allow people to get someone and then to gradually develop those relationships. I know after 9-11, the police relationships between the FBI and CARE, the Council of American and Islamic Relations, that really Detroit did a lot better than other places because of the trust between law enforcement and our Muslim community. And while we're still, in many ways, still very segregated uh, here in Southeast Michigan, in Metro Detroit, we are also growing more and more diverse all the time. And so isn't it important that these discussions continue to take place so that we continue to grow as, as a community? And I'll throw that out to, to any of you. Jalila, Jalila, you haven't spoken in a minute. Um, yes, we definitely need conversations centered around uh, the, the various topics, diversity, the systemic, systemic racism, you know, all these important uh, topics that are part of our social and political climate. And I think it's important to honor the, the real time. This is the time to have this conversation. This is a time to uh, work together, uh, bring faith leaders, community leaders, politicians, bring everyone to the table, discuss this, have the real talk, and, and look at what we could do together to uh, to increase accountability, policies, uh, things that will have a change uh, effect uh, and outcome. You know, we don't want to just limit it to conversations, but we, we need changes in our policies. We need changes in, in the accountability and the practices. Glenda, you have the next question. All right, well, you know, particularly at a time where we were all at home and maybe some of us had a different vantage point to get to see certain things that unfolded that continue to show that racism is at the core, a long time history of several foundations that still carry on through our society today. And it brought that to the forefront, but it also brought to the forefront the number of young people and people of all rates and faiths that don't want to see that kind of behavior continue. There were a sea of colors and kinds of people that were supporting the end of injustice that you know we had historically got the chance to lay our eyes on over the summer uh, following those gut-wrenching and unfortunate events. Dr. Marks did speak on the role of young people in our society and the exposure that they have now, as you were talking about, Dave. Let's hear that clip from the interview. Now, and Dr. Marks, I really believe that young people are the key. I mean, many of them that I speak to don't even want to be burdened with these old ideals and feelings that we carry around with us as a country. So they can be the change makers. You know, what's your hope for the new generation when it comes to understanding and accepting people who are different? Um, I'm optimistic. Uh, I think that the young people are in a position where they have more access and exposure to men, women, different racial groups, different ages, and different roles. So they have more balanced exposure coming up today than we had, well, I don't know how, oh, I don't wanna date myself here, but those of us who are more seasoned in life uh, may have only, when we think of police officers, we may think only men or surgeons, only men, or kindergarten teachers, only female, but they're seeing more of a balance. So coming out of that, um, Jalila, maybe back to you as an educator and hearing the conversations of young people over years. Is there a reignited and, and reengaged conversation about race or has it always been there? I think it's more now than ever before. Uh, the social media definitely does highlight a lot of this. You have uh, students that are uh, recording Zoom you know, uh, Zoom uh, classes uh, and conversations. Most recently, a teacher was called out on uh, the case of Brianna Brown and how she felt that uh, 
that, uh, you know, it, basically that, you know, she deserved what, what happened to her and students were calling her out. Students were calling her out during this Zoom session. And again, I think that they are now more engaged in the surroundings, what is happening in, the, in their world, and they are calling people out. And, and I think this is uh, very liberating. This is what we want to see. We want students to engage in their environment, in their communities, and uh, have a say. Uh, Chuck, I want to go to you, and I want to continue on, on this line of questioning. Um, you know, you do your show every week. I know you're out in the community talking to people. And yes, we did see a lot of young people engaged this summer, marching together, black, white, and people of all nationalities together with their arms locked. But I've done so many stories recently on racism rising in the classroom, hate messages to you know kids um, who are Asian, African Americans being called gorillas. I mean, really painful things. Uh, other students saying, "Go back home." Chuck, what are what are you hearing when you talk to people in our community about that? Yes, we've seen the positive, the marches, people coming together, but then we've seen the ugly side, and now we're listening to Dr. Mark saying we have to talk about all of it bring it forward so we can heal and make change? Well, I think it's mixed. Uh, we are certainly seeing some things that um, as older adults concern us that we didn't want to see our kids go through, uh, that we watched our parents go through and that we went through ourselves and we all want something better for our children. Uh, but to see these type of uh, racial tension and other ethnic uh, tension going on in our country now, um, it can be painful because you have to sit down and you have to have those conversations with your children. Um, I think what's important though, is to be very transparent and to have those open conversations. Conversely though, we've seen some wonderful examples of humanity from this generation coming up. This is a generation, particularly when you talk about uh, kids of color, that they've grown up in a much more integrated society in many respects than what some of us came through. Um, and some of them, even after going through that, whether they may have gone through integrated elementary and middle school and high schools, and because of some of what they saw, some of them, when it's time to go to college, they decide, okay, I want to go to maybe a historically black college and university because I feel I need that. I may have missed something that I didn't get when I was coming through the K through 12 system. Others decided that they want to go a much more diverse route. But look at the, what they're being exposed to. Um, you know, look at Southwest Detroit. It is the fastest growing neighborhood in the city of Detroit. Um, we look at Dearborn and other areas of the city of Detroit and other uh, Macomb County and other places in which the Arab American community is growing very, very fast. And we have one of the largest Arab American communities, um, you know, here in the United States we are becoming so diverse and these young people are interacting with each other. Um, they, it's almost second nature for them. And I think many of them don't like what they are seeing from some of the older generation and mm. they're determined to make some serious changes about it. Granted, you know, you know, when they see, we, we get a little bit of everything because there are also some young people who are sending out some very painful messages that bother us as well. And we've had to cover all of this as journalists, you know, even with the Sunday show that I do. I think part of my responsibility is to make sure that the people I'm interviewing and the topics that I'm taking on are as diverse as possible. Because when you do that, then you help to explode some of the stereotypes that exist out there and people get to see a different side in the beauty of our city and our state and our region. Which is so very important. And Dave, before I turn it over to you, you know we have people watching us on, <laughs> on Facebook. People are on our website at WXYZ.com. I have one comment here and it says, uh, Josephine and I just finished watching The Hidden Bias in Good People. What an insightful program. Uh, we enjoyed it. We took lots of notes. We just wanted to say to Channel 7, thank you for advocating for change. We appreciate you. So we know people are commenting and we want to share your comments uh, as well. Dave, I'm going to send it to you. And, and it's important that our company has made a, a tremendous commitment. Uh, we all went through an implicit bias training here 
uh, rather rigorous training, I, I would say, and, and Scripps has made this commitment to all 41 of the markets that uh, it serves with television stations. This program uh, and this discussion is, is certainly part of that. But Chuck mentioned the young people and, and the things that are sometimes said. We're on social media right now with this virtual town hall, which is important. Social media plays a larger role than ever with good and bad. And as it comes to this question of people getting along, of people uh, understanding each other, of people being kind to each other, that kind of comes and goes. Anybody want to tackle that? The, the, the social media aspect, does it make it harder for us to come together as a people at times, or can it help? Whoever wants to take a stab at that. I just think sometimes we, uh, we get into our peer groups and we're not hearing from people different from us. That's, that would be the challenge of these mm -hmm. uh, social media spaces. If, if they bring you to another to hear, uh, then that's good. Well, I would also add that um, I've seen um, chat forums where, where you tend to get feedback from all different types. Um, the one thing I think, though, that's come out of all of this that, 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 that makes a huge difference is that it's, and I think it's been universal through any race, is that it's not okay to just say, I'm not racist. You have to be anti-racist today. And, and in doing that, you have to make sure that, that you're, you know, not just being silent as opposed to in, in allowing things to happen as we've so many times done even even as an african-american we, we we allow it to happen we allow people to to be racist around us you have to now sort of speak up and make sure that those things aren't happening and even in these chat forms you know you you, you do get some input from different sides and and sometimes you need that i mean like you like like steve was saying oftentimes we tend to only associate with people that act and think like us so sometimes it is good and social media does give you that reach to sometimes get into you know, areas where you're, again, not so comfortable. And, you know, I'll add on very quickly that uh, there's another side to social media, and that is the fact that while it has broadened all of us in many respects and we interact much more because of social media, it has also served a good purpose in the sense that it has exposed a lot of warts out there. And stop mm -hmm. and think about all of the stories that we have done where people have said things on social media almost as though they were in a quiet little vacuum and then all of a sudden it gets telegraphed to a much larger society and we've seen people have to resign from important positions mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. people have had to apologize people have been um, you know forced to go into some type of diversity training because of what they said so there is a good side to that that sometimes things that would have stayed in a little closet have come out to the larger society and i think some people uh, have come out as bigger and better people once they were exposed. Dave, I know you want to comment, but Chuck, I want to just say this, and it's really dangerous right now when people go off on the dark web where you cannot see what people are saying and you cannot see the honesty in people. Sometimes it's better to have it out there in the open so you can see what people are thinking and they're being exposed so you can talk about it and sort of weed out the bad because those heading over to the dark web when you can't see what people are doing and you can't see people planning say an insurrection at the U.S. Capitol in Washington D.C. that's when it can be dangerous our, our social media platforms. Dave I know you wanted to weigh in though. Well and I just wanted to uh, bring Dr. Marks back in who offered advice for parents on this particular issue. We've talked about uh, high school kids, uh, we've talked about uh, the parents in our group here with their children. Dr. Marks uh, with some advice for parents who want to educate their older children as well. Take a listen. When they're in middle school, you can start talking to them more directly about, you know, people being treated differently in a concrete way, gender, race, religion, those sorts of things. And they'll begin to sort of understand them um, and have them uh, develop the skills where they can individuate, where they can see one other person as an individual and not as a, a representative of a category. Um, that sort of skill building early on is going to help quite a bit. Dr. Marks there. Uh, maybe I'll turn to uh, Jalila Ahmed, Superintendent, Hamtramck Schools, uh, again to weigh in here following uh, Dr. Marks' comments. 
uh, our parents, our teachers, you know, everyone that is in a position to influence our youth has a shared responsibility. Um, you know, just looking at the studies, uh, the studies indicate that the pedagogies that teachers have, their beliefs, their attitudes, it is shared with it, with the students in the classroom. So if you have a teacher that is uh, prejudiced against a certain group, the behavior that she or he has is picked up by the students and they will share the same prejudices, the same biases. Uh, parents also have an important role uh, to, you know, talk to their children. If they are, uh, you know, uh, children of privilege, uh, they should know that. They should know what that means and also their responsibility uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and likewise for everyone else. But I think it's being true to our world, what is happening around us, and, and also having these critical conversations with our children as parents, with our students as teachers and educators. Well said. Thank you. Glenda? Well, just listening to Dr. Marks talk about, you know, how times are changing. We've been talking about particularly for the next generation and how to handle this conversation right now. Um, but how can we be better? You know, even in talking to children, you know, we, we have our own thoughts, feelings, our own biases that are, that are natural. How can we be better adults? Does anybody have a thought on that? You know, you mentioned, Mark, about how you have to speak to your son, which in, you know, many ways, as we've been exploring throughout the topic of this conversation, can be different in an African-American household than it is in an, uh, another household about how to conduct yourself uh, with authorities and things like that. So what can we do? How can we be better adults? Well, well one thing I try to do is um, I try to live my creed, for lack of a better phrase. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. So, yes. so when you present a certain person or, or image, I can't just talk the talk to my children. I have to show them that this is how you react or how you deal with certain things. And so I really try to expose my son to his, and my daughters for that matter, to as many things as possible or situations where, you know, I have to be responsible. And that, cause it's, it's one thing my, my wife always stresses is we, our job isn't to raise them. Our job is to prepare them for, for, for society and for the different things that they're going to encounter. So, and ideally, you want them to know how to react when these things ultimately do happen, because, you know, it could be a racial situation. It could be a, an encounter with another student. It could be an encounter with with a police officer, whatever the situation may be, or just even authority at work or school. You've got to know how to manage that situation and, you know, react, but not necessarily overreact. So I try to, you know, at least expose my children mostly to the things that uh, or, or behavior that is appropriate and not just, you know, reactionary or, or, or taking a position based on how they necessarily feel. It's okay to, 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 to act or have to act against your feelings or something that you aren't necessarily comfortable or you believe you should be doing. It's okay to do that sometimes. And, you know, I always say when someone makes a comment, you know, you don't always have to have an opinion. Sometimes you can just take the information for what it's worth and move forward. I want, to, I want to weigh in on that, too. Thank you, Mark. And I'm going to weigh in with you, Glenda, and let you keep going. But I've done a couple of stories recently um, sort of talking about what Dr. Marx is trying to teach us about implicit bias. And there have been so many kids in our community at different schools, young African-American girls who talked about being teased about being a gorilla. And they used the story about Harambe, the gorilla who grabbed the young, man, young boy and pulled him around. I don't know if you all remember that, in the zoo. And so kids actually started coming up to African-American girls and making a gorilla sound and calling them a gorilla. And I heard that not only in Birmingham, I heard it at several uh, schools in different school districts and heard the same story. But the Anti-Defamation League went into these schools with a program called no place for hate taught teachers and kids 
how to respond to each other, and it made such a difference. Some of those kids who were making those hurtful remarks actually came up to those girls and said, I'm so sorry, I didn't know it was so painful. I didn't know. I mean, you would think they would know that, but through the teachings of No Place for Hate, not only did the teachers learn, not only did the students learn, but the school was just a better environment. That's why a program like what Dr. Marx is doing is so very important. The conversations are difficult to have. The teachers were saying that too. The students have a difficult time talking about it, but if we put it on the table, talk about it, even the hurtful things, I think change can come. Yeah, and you know, Karen, I think uh, to your question and Glenda's question, I think sometimes we have to be the strongest advocates for our children because yes. sometimes they are in peer pressure situations mm -hmm. Um, where it's difficult for them to speak out without fear of retribution. And so we have to oftentimes take on that position and confront those that are in positions to be able to make change in the settings that they're in. But the important thing also is flip side of that. I think as parents, we have to be careful not to take the baggage from our generation and put it on this generation coming up. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to learn how to listen to our children. Uh, you know, some of you know, they say out uh, of the mouths of babes, uh, you can learn a lot. And a lot of times I think that's very true if we just sit down and talk with them about what they're experiencing in their schools, uh, in their workplace, especially if they're young adults who just starting careers and they encounter things in the workplace that they aren't quite sure how to deal with or navigate. Um, that's important for us to listen to. It's in many respects what we, do as journalists, you know, we oftentimes have people, you know, laugh at us a lot of times and criticize and say, you know, all journalists are always talking, talking, talking. But we all know that usually the best journalists are those who learn how to really listen when they're doing interviews, uh, because a lot of times you miss something if you're so busy talking that you aren't listening to what's coming out of the from the answers or the questions that you've asked. So I think it goes all those different ways. You're right, Chuck. I, I wanna play a clip right now. It's, it's talking about children and the best way to balance exposure to all walks of life. Dr. Mark said, there are things we can do as parents, like making sure they are reading books or watching shows with diverse characters when they're younger. Take a listen to this. If, you, if your children on the younger end, or maybe you know, 10 years old or less, at that point, you don't want to get into deep conversations of history of race and racism and sexism, but it's balance of exposure. What are they watching? What are they reading? Who are the characters? So they watch a TV show, they watch Craig of the Creek and then Dora, then they watch this or that. I have young kids. But um, balance. So when you say, well, uh, well, who can play the king or the queen? They can say, oh, it could be a black person, a white person, a male, female. I mean, so the notion is you want to get them to the point where you present a hero or a character or a villain, and they can say, that can be anyone. Steve or Jalila, you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, sure. So again, um, understanding our children, uh, looking at conversation pieces to have with our children uh, instead of having a yes, no, or good or bad. And but, Steve? And, and that's bit. We lost Jalila's audio a little bit. S Steve? Yes, yeah, so uh, Gordon Elport wrote the book, The Nature of Prejudice. It was in the late 50s, but he said the key, the key to eliminating prejudice is to expose young people before adolescence to the other. And I know uh, I drag my kids around to more mosques, the 4-H club in Detroit where I mm -hmm. come from Plymouth to play basketball. So they were set. But what about, um, what about me? I, I was not set. And so I'm continually peeling away my ignorance. And if it wasn't for my friends in the Plymouth Canton beloved community, Amina, my Muslim friend, uh, Summer and Harry, my black friends and others that I regularly hear from, uh, I'm developing an understanding that I wouldn't have had. I mean, Harry's had to have the talk with his son four times and his son's only six years old. Stuff I just wouldn't think of. So to the earlier question about what about us adults, and I, I think we just have to find places to keep growing and I'll be spending the rest of my life working on this stuff. You know, interesting too, uh, Carolyn, when you mentioned Harande, you know, the first thing that went through my mind as maybe many of you sitting here is the picture. It was the picture of that gorilla dragging around a baby. Yeah. So the first thing that enters your mind is what you see. You, you can't erase what you see and the feelings that you get behind that. You know, and I think that was a major point of what Dr. Marx was trying to say is dig deeper 
into yeah. those images so that they don't shape false impressions. You cannot erase seeing Derek Chauvin kneel for eight minutes and 46 seconds. So that may give you fear for police officers. That may give you, you know, and in that situation with that particular officer, that was an earned response to a public watching that. So, you know, not taking what you see and applying it to everything and everyone is a hard thing to do. It's a rewiring, you know, and that's mm -hmm. where it takes that work, you know, as Dr. Marx was referring to. Who wants to weigh in on that? You know, let me just say that I think at the root of what we're really talking about here to a great extent is fear. Uh, people get very comfortable with whatever situation that they have. And we know that America is becoming increasingly diverse. And that has created fear by many people. Many people believe, well, if it's becoming more diverse, then that means I'm going to lose something. Well, it doesn't have to mean that. If you embrace the diversity, mm -hmm. uh, you reach out to people, you learn from them, uh, you can create a strength by America's diversity, as opposed to taking the position, if you're now coming into the workplace or you're now coming into a particular social group, then that means that I'm gonna lose my status. And I think that's a fear that we have to work at, have to deal with and have to you know, try to alleviate that. It's, it's, it's much easier said than done because it's natural instinct for people to be able to wrap their arms around something, especially if they have not been exposed to someone who doesn't look like them, think like them, worship like them, uh, live in their same neighborhood. Well, I want to make a quick comment on what Glenda talked about because she talked about Derek Chauvin. I think Police Chief James Craig has done an exceptional job in the city of Detroit with his community policing and sending police officers in our community so they know who's in the neighborhood. They know who the troublemaker is. They know who the good kids are. And I don't want to say bad kids because I don't really believe any kid is bad. I think they just may make bad choices and that sort of thing. But somebody like Derek Chauvin, if you, if you listen to his history, you know, he was afraid of African-American men. But I think if police officers are in our community, they know who's in the community, they're walking the streets, and they know what to do, then people won't be afraid of officers. They, we can work together. And I think Chief Craig has done an exceptional job, especially in the city, city of Detroit with that. Now, I want to I want to read something really quick because some of the feedback coming in on Facebook. Uh, Angela Snell says, thank you for bringing this critical discussion mm -hmm. into our homes tonight in a way that we can also share together as a community. And Denise Burden says, I'm amazed and grateful that WXYZ ABC aired this program while I was watching. My daughter entered the room and did not believe that this was being aired on a major network. Thank you. ABC. Wow, that makes me smile. That makes my heart feel good to hear uh, messages like that. Right, Dave and Glenda? I think it almost brings a tear to your eye, yeah. you know, because uh, it, it, it shows that it's making an impact and it has tremendous meaning as well, right? And we recognize that we've got a lot of work to do. I mean, it's that being comfortable with being uncomfortable. I mean, we all need to be there if we are going to continue to grow. I mean, it's, it's, it's just that simple. If you're resistant to it, if you're hesitant about it, if you don't want to be honest with yourself, uh, it's, it's going to be that much harder. But we all need to get to that space, in my view, anyway. And Glenda, we've done that as colleagues in the newsroom. We talk about so many things and talk about how it's uncomfortable to bring up things that, that happen in our community, even things that happen in our newsroom. But we do it. It's uncomfortable, but we do it, right? And we have to do it because we do have a diverse community and we represent everyone, you know, and seeing that level of hate you know, seeing, you know, someone with their hand in their pocket so comfortable taking someone's life, you know, you have to have those discussions and they are very uncomfortable, but it will not change unless there's understanding. Steve, are we making progress, do you think? I mean, the fact that uh, Dr. Marks is, is traveling the country with his team, uh, working with police departments, for instance, when we talk about uh, the justice system, uh, meeting and reaching 
thousands of police officers in that one particular aspect of, of life that's so important to, to every community. Do you feel we're making progress in, in this regard? Well, I'm, I appreciate the question of, of the panelists. I'm probably the wrong person to ask because uh, I'm, I'm most privileged in every aspect of my life. So I, I, I would miss things. I mean, I know there's a, our phone is ringing off the hook. People want to get on the right side of history, but it's so deep, right? I mean, the, the progress is going to take time. I know there's some, you know, starts going and people trying to get it right, but I, I would take your question and turn to my colleagues here and ask them what they think. Mark, you want to tackle that one? Well, um, I'll, I'll give it a shot. I'll say, um, well, you know, the, the main thing is, uh, in terms of the, you know, comfortable being uncomfortable, it's okay to recognize people's differences. I mean, when I walk in the room, I don't, you know, people try to use, you know, I don't see color or, you know, we don't see color. Well, it's okay to see color. I want you to see my color. I want you to recognize that I'm a black man that's coming in this room and I, I don't necessarily fit this stereotype or I may fit this one. But at the same time, know me for who I am. And I, again, kind of like my dealership, I don't want you to walk in and feel like it's a black owned dealership. I just want you to feel like it's a nice dealership. Oh, oh, and then you may notice that it's owned by a black, you know, man or black family. So, so all those things, um, I, I think we really just need to, to embrace our differences or look to try and embrace our differences. Um, uh, my, I mean, my wife's biracial and, you know, we all, we ultimately do things wherever we we are i mean we don't we don't necessarily look to do things in a black area or in a white area we just we just do things i mean there's often times we'll look up and you know being in the dealership space that i'm in where there's you know there's just not a lot of minority there but i don't act any differently from who i am and 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 neither does she and that's that's the that's the, i think the beauty of us learning to embrace our difference or, or having, having learned to embrace our differences and, um, and, and hoping to instill that in our children that it's, you know, it's okay to be who you are and, and for people to recognize you as who you are. And, um, and, 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 and I think everyone will be better off when we begin to do that more. Absolutely. Now, I'm going to call for some sound from Dr. Mark, some positive sound, but I want each of us to think, like, after listening to Dr. Marks and listening to everything that he said, what will you take with you you know, what have you learned? What will you do at your job or in your community or in your home to bring progress? Now, I do want you to hear this. When we spoke with Dr. Marks, he said America does have signs of progress. Hallelujah. Let's listen. I am constantly optimistic. I see signs of progress. The fact that we're talking about um, implicit bias or explicit bias at a national level, and it's not threatening to hear somebody say, okay, there's been racial differences historically, but we can own that, identify the challenge, come up with solutions and move forward. I'm gonna say one thing and then I'm gonna throw it out to each of you. I know as a youngster growing up in the city of Detroit, I grew up at a little small Catholic church um, with a lot of African-Americans in my neighborhood. But I remember my mother would have a, a sort of a teen group and to make us feel uncomfortable and to learn about other people, she would take a group of us from the city of Detroit into the suburbs, to the all white suburbs, and we would actually stay in homes with white families. And we would play softball over the weekend and we'd have a party and we'd have lunch. And it was just to, for us to see that we're really no different. I mean, our skin color may be different, but we lived the same, we ate the same, our music might have been a little different, we played the same. And it was just to make you feel uncomfortable, to get, but to get rid of some of that uncomfortableness and just to learn that we really all are the same. That was way back when, but I think some of those lessons are bring, being brought forward today, like I said, with the uh, Anti-Defamation League, with their No Place for Hate. Just letting kids know, you know, we, we all are the same. We bleed the same. You know what I mean? Our hearts are the same. You know, w one other lesson that the Anti-Defamation League did with some young kids, they had them put oranges on the table and they colored the oranges, like one was red, one was yellow, one was black, one was brown. And then when the kids peeled the oranges, they found they're all the same on the inside, which is sort of a lesson for little kids to learn. Um, so what do you take from Dr. Marks? I mean, what can you do at home to teach kids or maybe some of your colleagues at your workplace, you know, to change for the better? Whoever so wants to start. 
I can start. Okay. So I think I think the very first part is to understand that and have an, uh, an understanding that implicit bias exists and we all share that. Uh, I think having an awareness of what it is. And I think the next step is once we understand the, the, the biases that each of us hold, what practices, what changes will we do? And I'll give you an example. You know, I have a principal who fundamentally believes all children are valued, are appreciated, but at the same time, in the practices, if students have an infraction, suspension is the number one alternative. Students belong in schools. So again, when we go back, looking and reflecting on the behavior, what will we do to make improvements in how we treat our students if they have infractions? What can we do without suspending them? Because again, I have to emphasize they belong in schools. Uh, so again, having that that appreciation and that value for children is one thing, but then in, in the behavior and the practices that we have is a totally uh, different thing. And it's strong and it is, like I said, the binding between that holds us accountable and responsible. Wonderful, Jalila. Mark, you want to weigh in next? Well, you know, the number one thing I really took from, uh, from Dr. Marks is uh, overall presentation was sort of what uh, Jalila just sort of spoke to, you know, the, the idea that, you know, we're all going to have our own, you know, biases or implicit biases, regardless, regardless of sort of how educated, et cetera, we are. But what the difference maker is our plan and how we react to them and how we choose to, to take our position going forward. And I think that's the number one thing I'm going to look to try and be educated on is what can I do or how can I change my behavior to not necessarily fall into the, 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 the trap of the quote unquote implicit bias? Wonderful. Steve? Yeah, I uh, appreciated uh, Dr. Mark speaking of the systems that are, we're involved with, uh, taking an implicit bias and thinking of it as an individual endeavor, part of the self-help you know, culture. You can't think of it that way because Implicit bias is developed in systems, it's reinforced, it's allowed in certain cultures and systems. What I take away is to, uh, to try to change the systems I see that have uh, anti-black uh, you know, racism baked into them. I know that's not something you want to talk about at Thanksgiving, but it's a reality. And so for me, it's to, uh, to challenge those systems. Amen. Wow, Chuck. Um, I think what I got out of him more than anything was open your mind and don't be afraid to have uncomfortable conversations and to have honest conversations, whether it's at home with your own family or it's in the workplace. You know, at Channel 7, we have an EDI uh, committee and quarterly we meet to talk about what we're doing at the station, what we're doing in the newsroom, what we're doing in sales, what we're doing in uh, other departments and what we're doing as a station as a whole. And it fits in with our corporate owners, which have really pushed this broadcast that you just saw with Dr. Marks uh, on more than 60 of their stations across the nation. Um, that's leadership. And, 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 and they're probably taking a chance because you can bet that not everybody is going to love that they have put this broadcast on in a way where large numbers of people can see them. De Detroit and Michigan is very diverse, but we also have stations in parts of the country that are not as diverse as what we're used to seeing right here. Uh, so they're advancing this important conversation. Uh, it's happening in corporate America. Everybody is talking about this, and I think talking is the first big step. But it's also happening in, you know, in the sports world and in the music world. And if there's one thing that people oftentimes can uh, come together on, it's sports and it's music. You know, I look at the NBA mm -hmm. All-Star Game the other evening and all the emphasis on historically black colleges and universities. Uh, you know, you I stop and think about, we were talking about Colin Kaepernick a couple of years ago and the reaction to the sports world and now look at what's happening mm -hmm. in the sports world advancing this. So I'm optimistic that uh, we're gonna make progress. Dave and Glenda, we've got about, you know, a minute left. So how about you all give me your last thoughts? Well, I'll, I'll say, you know, with a young girl at home, um, and it's the small things, Carolyn, like you said, right? Your mother would take you to play with white families and spend time with families outside of your race. You know, even 
in our home, you know, I'll, we grew up with Cameron not saying black and white. We didn't do black and white, we did color. Tell me what they look like, chocolate, tan, peach, light brown. I mean, we mm -hmm. did further description as to who they are. Everything's not black and white, and we wanted that message to be clear early on. Absolutely. Ten mm -hmm. seconds, Dave. I'm just happy that we've had this conversation, that all of you have uh, joined us for this virtual town hall tonight, and hopefully it's made uh, an impact, a positive impact in our community. So right about that. So great, meaningful conversation. You said that just right, Dave Llewellyn. Uh, we want to thank Steve, Jalila, Mark, and Chuck for your time tonight. And, uh, you know, making everyone think at home. Look in the mirror, think and think about what you can do at work at your own home. Uh, loved you for being here with us tonight. Hopefully you've been enlightened just a little bit, right? Indeed. And 7 Action News remains committed to shining a light on hidden bias and making our community more accepting, compassionate, and united. Yes, we are with you and we hope that you remain with us. There's so much good we can do as a community and as human beings. This is just one step in the right direction. For now, we want to leave you with those promising practices for reducing implicit bias uh, that Dr. Marks went over tonight so we can all work them through in our own lives and our own decision making. And that means removing uh, any of the blinders that we have so we can get rid of our implicit bias. Uh, and so we've got a lot of work to do, but Dr. Marks has given us a lot to think about. A decision blinding, discretion elimination, accountability, mind Mindfulness, increase opportunities for pra positive practices, should I say. Yeah, hold yourself accountable and increase opportunities uh, to continue to learn. You'll find much more on this important conversation on our website, WXYZ.com. Have a great night, and we'll see you on 7 Action News at 11 and for Action News at 10 on TV20 Detroit. Have a great night, everybody.